Africa seeks investment to stem migration as the EU summit begins. Fostering more women entrepreneurs is the focus of a global conference in India. And Africa's most populous city aims to become an art and design hub. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCory. This is Africa 54. European Union leaders met their African counterparts in Ivory Coast on Wednesday for discussions expected to focus on migration. The summit is due to focus on education, investment in youth and economic development to prevent refugees and economic migrants uh, from attempting uh, the treacherous journey across the Mediterranean. Like many African leaders, I've recourse President Alassane Ouattara has called for Europe to broaden the legal avenues for migration from the continent using mechanisms such as student and temporary work visas. Now for more on the EU-Africa summit, a journalist Leon de Bassompierre joins me live via Skype from Abidjan. Uh, Leon, uh, first uh, tell us a, a little more about uh, the theme of this summit and what the expectations are right there. Well, it's quite a, a long theme that they have, and it's quite uh, intense, saying harnessing the demographic divide through investments in the youth. And what it roughly means is finding opportunities for youth across both continents, in fact, so that they steer clear of migration, that they steer clear of terrorism, and they look for new opportunities in the countries where they hail from. So this summit is really about finding those opportunities and opening the conversation to a broader understanding between Africa and Europe about youth issues and how they can better improve the lives of the young people in both continents. And I know there are many stakeholders there. What are some of the suggestions that are being presented? Well, the summit only got underway a couple of hours ago, so we've just had the opening statement, so no real suggestions have come out as yet. And this is something that was brought up by civil society, saying that in the run-up to the summit, there's not been enough involvement from them as to what this summit actually needs to achieve. So it's something that we will keep a close eye on, on the, in the next couple of days as the summit unfolds. And uh, 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 there are some people there you may have spoken to, Oxfam, for example. What are they saying? What do they think uh, needs to be done? Well, in fact, Vincent, Oxfam was one of the organizations, they are an anti-poverty organization. They've been speaking on the sidelines of the summit, saying they were not included in all aspects of the organization. They've said that the summit needs to take responsibility, for example, for the issues that we've seen that have emerged from Libya, reports of slavery uh, by migrants in the past a few weeks. And this is a big issue that everybody has mentioned, all speakers, from the opening statements made by Presidents Alassane Ouattara, the Ivorian president, to the Secretary General of the United Nations, the AU Commissioner, and several other uh, speakers that have spoken today have spoken out against uh, what's been happening in Libya. And these um, organizations like Oxfam, for example, saying that we need to come, we should not just be condemning them, but we should look at, at possible ways that we can mitigate this from happening. Uh, we've had the South African president, Jacob Zuma, saying that we also need to be looking to help Libya in seeing how they can help as a member of the African Union and um, help them dealing with this crisis as well. Is there any indication that they would also discuss the issue of uh, repressive governments? We know that some people leave their countries, not necessarily for economic reasons, but also because of the political situation at home. Yes, the, the distinction has been made, in fact, into what kind of migrants you have. As you mentioned, uh, some people leave their countries or want to get out of their countries exactly for that reason. Um, the other issue that has been uh, tried to be brought on the table by the European Union is in terms of um, support to the ICC uh, the, as part of good governance. But the African Union has not uh, wanted to elaborate on that and has actually declined to include that as part of uh, the, the draft resolution. Uh, quickly tell us a little bit about the mood in that city and how much, uh, how well it's coping with the many hundreds of visitors. While well, several key boulevards have been closed across the uh, economic capital of Ivory Coast, Abidjan, uh, locals here have been complaining they haven't been able to get to school and work and spending hours uh, in the traffic as a result of the road closures. The 
actual venue where it's being held is the Hotel Iwa, which is an historic uh, building where it's taking place. Uh, it's extremely crowded, but there's a very a nice vibe to what's happening at the, at the summit venue, uh, though I don't know that Ivorians will be too happy about yeah. what's been happening, but it's it's really put the, the, the city back on the map, so to speak, uh, bringing oh. this vibe back to uh, West Africa. Okay, Leon, let's see if we can catch up with you tomorrow after um, those discussions have taken place. Now, uh, that is a journalist, uh, Leon Du Basson-Pierre, who is in Abidjan and joined us via Skype. All the way south, a Zimbabwean court found activist Pastor Evan Mawarire not guilty of subversion, uh, rather subversion on Wednesday in a case that has been scrutinized as a barometer of independence of the courts and the new president Emerson Mnangagwa. Mawarire has been a strident critic of former President Robert Mugabe, who was forced to resign after 37 years in power last week under pressure from the army and the ruling ZANU-PF party. Critics allege that Zimbabwe's courts for decades have been used as a tool of political repression. The pastor's hashtag this flag movement had been a thorn in the side of the former Mugabe government. In 2016, Mawarire led a stay-at-home demonstration that led to the first of his several arrests. Absolutely elated today that um, the courts have decided after considering the evidence that came before them that I am not guilty and that um, the charges that were leveled against me uh, do not hold any water and of course they have proceeded to, uh, to discharge me on both charges. Uh, one which was the main charge which was um, uh, subverting a constitutional government and the alternative charge which was inciting public violence. I do hope that the new administration that is coming in with the new president is going to be more aware that the citizens of our nation are not enemies to our government, but that they are allies in building a better Zimbabwe, that they need to be listened to. Well, Amnesty International said in a statement they hoped that the ruling represents a new beginning for the country. Now, a federal jury in Washington has convicted a Libyan man of terrorism in the deadly attack on the U.S. consulate in Benghazi. But the jury acquitted Ahmed Abu Khattala of the most serious charge, murder. The 2012 attack killed four people, including U.S. Ambassador to Libya, Christopher Stevens. U.S. commandos captured Ahmed Abu Khattala in 2014 and brought him to the United States for deep interrogation and trial. Khattala will likely spend decades in federal prison after he is sentenced. Another suspect, Mustafa al-Imam, was captured last month and also faces trial. U.S. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson has condemned what he called Russia's continued behavior towards its neighbors, especially its interfering in election processes and promoting non-democratic ideals. In a major speech Tuesday ahead of his trip to Europe next week, Tillerson said the United States is committed to helping its European allies secure their borders and curb their dependence on Russian oil and gas. An analyst tells viewers, Larry Zahok, that uh, the U.S. president's support is crucial for the success of Tillerson's mission. Basis. Tillerson told an audience in Washington Tuesday that the United States and Europe recognize the active threat of a recently resurging Russia. In view of Russia's Zapad military exercises conducted near the borders of Baltic states in September, our ability to respond to an attack in concert with our allies is more important than ever. Tillerson condemned Russia's military aggression in Georgia and Ukraine and also warned about its interference in political processes throughout Europe. He said the United States is planning to increase its defense budget for Europe and help curb Europe's dependence on Russian oil and gas. The United States is liberalizing rules governing the export of liquefied natural gas and U.S. produced crude and we're eager to work with European allies to ensure the development of needed infrastructure like import terminals and interconnecting pipelines to promote the diversity of supply to Europe. Tillerson pledged that sanctions against Russia will remain in place until Ukraine is once again independent and sovereign throughout its territory. 
The message Tillerson is taking to a NATO meeting in Brussels and an OSC meeting in Vienna next week is strong, says analyst Klaus Lares. The question, of course, is how much influence does Tillerson have? How much influence does the Department of State still have? We all know it is the president who sets the tone in foreign policy as well. And President Trump has been much more lukewarm about American commitment to Europe. Lares says that the U.S. president has an ambiguous relationship with Russia, and Tillerson's words alone may not reassure the European allies. But he commends Tillerson's message to Ukraine that its future lies largely in its own hands. So the Ukrainian government itself has a lot to do to bring some domestic stability to that part of Ukraine, at least, which is far removed from any uh, Russian interference and far removed from eastern Ukraine. And here the job of the Ukrainian government is large, and it's a very daunting task. But they have to approach that, because how can they expect to get Western support if they are not trying to bring their own house in order? The international relations analyst tells VOA the United States and Europe are right to insist on Russia abiding by the 2014 Minsk agreement on restoring peace in eastern Ukraine, but that insisting on Russia's returning the Crimea Peninsula to Ukraine will not bear fruit. Zlatica Hoek, VOA News, Washington. One of Korea's overnight test firing of what is believed to be an intercontinental ballistic missile, the first since September, has ratcheted up tensions and may indicate Pyongyang is now capable of hitting the U.S. mainland, says analysts. While it was quickly condemned by the United States and the international community, South Korea also warned the North not to miscalculate. Viewers Daniel Schaaf reports from Seoul. South Korea responded to North Korea's overnight test of an intercontinental ballistic missile within minutes, firing short-range missiles of its own into the sea and warning that miscalculation could lead to a preemptive strike. It's uh, very concerning, it's very um, serious, but any argument for uh, preventive war against North Korea must um, stand upon the argument that North Korea cannot be deterred and I just think that's a, a fallacy. North Korea can be deterred. South Korean President Moon Jae-in said Pyongyang's action endangered international peace and security. South Korea and the United States, along with the international community, have no other choice but to continue applying strong pressure and sanctions. Commenting on the North's missile test, U.S. President Donald Trump told reporters we will take care of it. He did not elaborate but said there was no change in approach to North Korea. Nothing changed. Nothing changed. We have a very serious approach and nothing changed. We take it very seriously. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe called for an emergency meeting of the United Nations Security Council. While the cost for Pyongyang may increase, analysts say it is not going to give up its nuclear and missile programs. These capabilities are something that cannot be negotiated away. It's part of their identity. It's part of their national security policy. They view all of the uh, UN Security Council resolutions uh, prohibiting these activities as illegitimate, and they will continue to challenge those uh, uh, UN Security Council resolutions and challenge the uh, international community. Pyongyang says it needs a strong deterrent to prevent an attack from the United States. Daniel Sheriff, VOA News, Seoul. Well, I want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover during the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We are still streaming our show live on Facebook, so check us out and share our show with your friends. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCory. Coming up, focusing on women's empowerment in the business world. Stay with us. This is BizBeat. Retailers are cashing in on the hot-selling baby product market, especially in the United Kingdom, which has had a baby boom of late. Suzanne Roeberger is the manager of the Olympia Baby Show. People are spending more. They're buying more products. Spending is up 20% over the past three years in the UK with demands for innovative and convenient products, like a thermometer linked to an app on your phone that also gives advice on how to manage a high-temperature reading. 
The Chico Next to Me crib is a hot selling co-sleeper, allowing parents to provide care without having to get out of bed. Zahir Sattar is the director of Baby Planet. Parents want to sort of help themselves sleep as much as they can. We know the little ones wake up every three to four hours. Another idea, the fold-up stroller that you can place in the overhead compartment of passenger planes. The worldwide baby product market is predicted to be $121 billion by 2025. For BOA's BizBeat, I'm Philip Alexio. How do you see the world? I see countries in turmoil. I see our planet changing. I see people at peace. No matter how you see the world, you'll get an unbiased and uncensored view of it on Voice of America, on television, radio, online, and mobile. In more than 40 languages all day, every day, millions of people tune us in. How do I see the world? On Voice of America. Well, Botswana Diamonds, uh, in the news with Prince Harry's engagement to Meghan Markle, here's a look at the local economy with Africa 54 business correspondent Jill Malandrino reporting from the Nasdaq market site in Times Square in New York City. By now, the world knows that Prince Harry designed the engagement ring for fiance Meghan Markle, enlisting royal jewelers and selecting a stunning diamond from Botswana with the centerpiece and diamonds from his late mother, Prince Diana's jewelry collection. And with that happy news, let's take a look at Botswana's diamond business and overall economy. Since gaining independence from Britain in 1966, Botswana has marched into the ranks of upper middle income countries, forged a stable political culture and used the proceeds of its diamond industry to slash poverty. Yet while citizens look with relative satisfaction on half a century of development, the future looks less certain. As the crucial diamond mines yield fewer and fewer stones, some estimates suggest reserves cut by 2050, the country is being forced to reassess its one-track growth model. Now, according to Biggie Ganda Butal, that's Botswana's assistant minister for investment, trade, and industry, Botswana is trying to diversify from the export of diamonds to things like beneficiation, cutting, and polishing. She says in a quote, we want to turn Botswana into the diamond capital of the world so that when you mention Antwerp and other such cities, Botswana will be on the same keel. In a bed to sidestep costs, productivity, deficit, and competition from India, the government has launched a, a generous incentive program to lure companies to Botswana, including tax breaks for businesses and relocated workers. The goal is to have companies compelled to put down permanent roots, especially when the market takes a downturn and the lure of additional diamonds decreases. From the NASDAQ market site in New York, I'm Jill Malandrino, and this is Africa 54 Business News. Well, now this week, more than 1,000 entrepreneurs, business executives, and government officials are in Hyderabad, India, to discuss ways to empower people to start businesses and build networks. The focus of the 8th Annual Global Entrepreneurship Summit is women who still lag behind men when it comes to founding businesses and getting funding. Michelle Quinn reports from Hyderabad. There is an excitement in the air here at the Hyderabad International Convention Center as the 8th Annual Global Entrepreneurship Summit gets underway. Put on by the American and Indian governments, attendees have come from all over the world to talk up their businesses and projects. Among them, Safi Tukane, a Mauritanian who has created a rice distribution business. I'm hoping to have contacts to have more contacts uh, with a strong entrepreneur woman and also get new ideas from other people, and j just network. Women and entrepreneurship is the summit's focus. More than half of the 1,500 attendees are women, with 10 countries, including Afghanistan and Saudi Arabia, sending all women delegates. It's a point Please, made by both together. Ivanka Trump, special advisor to the U.S. Minister. President, and Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi, who addressed the gathering. And I especially want to congratulate the women entrepreneurs here with us today. Thank you. This year's summit is focused on a theme that is key to our future, women first, prosperity for all. 
Mandy Nguyen from Vietnam says she appreciates the focus on women. In some traditional uh, cultures like in Asia, uh, people expect women to be like just at home and not expressing themselves in the way that they deserve to be. So for us, with this focus is make people understand more about the potentials and the capabilities of women. In the coming days, attendees will dig into such topics as technology and finance, digital entertainment, and agriculture. They will also soak up the summit's larger message that entrepreneurship can be a vehicle to empower people to change their communities. Michelle Quinn, VOA News, Hyderabad, India. What is that now for a short break? Still to come on Africa 54, a festival in Lagos celebrates art from the continent. We'll be right back. That I am not guilty and that um, the charges that were leveled against me I do not hold any water, and of course they have proceeded. Together with our friends and partners in the region is uh, ready to help, but uh, uh, we want to do it in the, in the context of some, some democratic progress. Welcome back to Africa 54 and here's what's trending. The Africa Culture and Design Festival is underway in Lagos, Nigeria with exhibitions featuring a mix of traditional African art and modern and contemporary art. Organizers of the celebration of African art and design aim to provide a platform for creatives and raise awareness of Africa's home grown talent, rather homegrown talent. Now trends in Nigerian art shows growth potential with Nigerians collecting artworks from other parts of Africa, as well as with the rising cost of art materials. Some art schools have decided to provide the basics like paper and pencils to help students from less privileged homes. Earlier, Martin Rees has seen the eye roll and hard it before water tastings only in LA. Now, Los Angeles is the birthplace of many food trends and may prove the perfect setting for the next phase in a campaign to make people think about water in the same way they think about wine. U.S. consumers spent nearly $19 billion in bottled water in 2016, more than any other no nation. That's according to Euromonitor International. Rees moved his fine water campaign to sunny California from Germany in 2011. His 20 item water ma uh, menu features selections ranging from eight dollars to twenty dollars per, per bottle one bottle well and finally when it comes to making fake goods china is the counterfeit capital of the world now a china-based company called wale mali has developed anti-counterfeit labels that are fixed to a product to let consumers know for certain that it is genuine uh, the label allows consumers to scan the label using the Wally My app to securely check its authenticity and where it, is clim uh, it comes from. Chinese officials have un unearthed a series of recent food health scandals, including rice contaminated with heavy metals, the use of recycled uh, gutta oil in restaurants, as well as the sale of baby formula cont containing lethal amounts of the industrial chemical melamine. And that is what is trending today. Now, the Museum of the Bible is Washington, D.C.'s newest addition to the distinct monuments of America's capital city. Africa 54's Esther the Ewart attended the grand opening of the museum and brings us this story. 
The 430 square feet museum of the Bible is just a walk away from the U.S. Capitol and is dedicated to the narrative and impact of the Bible. Jeremy Barton is the museum's communications director. The Bible is a global phenomenon. Um, it has impacted so many people around the world, and we wanted to give the Bible a new home, so we've done that here in Washington, D.C. Here at the world of Jesus of Nazareth, Robbie Pruitt, who acts as Eli, shows us how grapes are crushed. To work with our hands is a blessing, or our feet in this case. So the grapes are crushed, and the juice flows and is collected to ferment. Ruth Dowdell acts as Rebecca and walks us through the types of foods eaten in ancient Israel. The family will gather around the pot of stew made of lentils and we'll dip our bread into it. And it's a time when we can talk as a family and my husband often will share stories of the Torah and teach our children during that time. At this recreated synagogue, Bruce Willianen acts as Jeremiah, an elder at the village of Nazareth. He tells me about the Torah a scroll on the table written in Hebrew. We read from these scrolls on Sabbath in the mornings. In every synagogue in Judea, the same passages are being read. Helena Zagami, a University of Maryland student, says she was most impressed by the technical splendor of the museum. The technology here is honestly cutting edge. It's things I've never seen before, ways that they use lights, the ways that they use the different exhibits, and I just feel like it's definitely a new experience for people coming to visit D.C. Every floor has a different design, a unique feel and an incredible capture of natural sounds like this recreated first century Nazareth village. There are actually 14,000 hand-painted rocks inside of it. And we have trees that are around that facility that are made out of rubbings, off of rubbings from the Garden of Gethsemane. So they look like the trees. If anyone, if you've ever been to Israel and seen the trees in the Garden of Gethsemane, it, they look exactly like it. For D.C. resident Melinda Jefferson, the visit was somewhat emotional. Immediately when you walk in, you just get awestruck by the beauty, and there's so much technology here. Um, it, I feel like no matter what faith you might believe in, to be able to just learn more about the Bible and where these artifacts came from, it's truly amazing. Among the museum's attractions are a children's center, a restaurant and an entertainment theater. For some tourists, it's like a virtual tour of ancient Israel. You do get a good idea of the Jewish traditions as you come in here and you'll see ancient writings to Dead Sea Scroll fragments to ancient parchment. It's a real wow moment for everyone that's walked into the museum. to get to you at VOA News, Washington. And that's our show for today. Thanks for watching. Have a good night. Welcome to English in a Minute. Most people enjoy listening to music. But is this expression actually about songs and tunes? Music to my ears. Jonathan, I cannot believe we have to work over the weekend. Did you not hear the news? The meeting for the project got canceled. No work this weekend after all. Awesome! That is music to me.